Would you join me in prayer? <clears throat> Lord, that is our heart's desire. Make us your servants. The next few moments, Lord, we ask for your spirit to guide us as we look at this topic, self-control. May you speak through me and to me once more. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you to all who's made the service beautiful. I know it doesn't take overnight to practice with the little ones. It's been so beautiful and such a joy to witness. Thank you, guys. I know it's early. I know it's early. We are so thankful. Good morning. We've been on a journey this summer talking about the fruit of the Spirit, in case you are unaware. Um, In Galatians chapter 5, it's been... I'll tell you, it's been such a blessing to hear from our colleagues, our, our friends, and invited uh, guest speakers, so to speak. Some are not so much guestly. Um, and just to be able to hear how they unpack the passage and each of the fruit of the Spirit. And this morning, I get to close out our series with the last fruit of the Spirit, self-control. Now, I have to tell you... I, At the outset, when the staff asked me to talk about self-control, I immediately thought in my mind, are you sure you got the right person? Shouldn't we be asking someone that's more restrained, more, you know, with more white hair and gray hair and a little more sageness, right? Are you sure you got the right person? You want me to end our series on Fruit of the Spirit on self-control. No one's laughing, that's good. I have a terrible sweet tooth, just for example. (laughs) One time my dentist told me the number of cavities I had at one point. And I looked at her and in her eyes, I'm like, whoa, that's as many as the roster of the Los Angeles Lakers. (laughs) You may be laughing and then you, like her, she was laughing and she's like, wait, how many is that? It's like, you can look it up. That would be a little game we played. But we laughed. Thankfully, I don't have that many cavities anymore. It's zero. All the fires are put out. But I think most of us view self-control like that one long overdue dentist appointment. All right? It's necessary, but dreaded. If we could postpone it again and again without any consequence, wouldn't you? (laughs) I hear an amen. It's true. See, my experience with self-control is as real as Paul's when he says in Romans 7, I don't fully understand my own actions. I don't do the good that I know I want to do, but instead I do the bad that I hate doing. And I keep on doing it, Paul says. So full disclosure, I'm only 33 years old and clearly not an expert on self-control, but I will share what I found from this text, when I study the Bible and when I read up on this topic, I realize that I am sorely lacking, one, self-control, but it's not necessarily about how old we are or the breadth of our life experience or the amount of mistakes we made or the victories that we've had. Don't get me wrong, they're related, as I found, but it's more about our willingness to surrender and to trust God. Let me say that again. Self-control is about our willingness to surrender and to trust God. And that's exactly what I want to talk about more today. But first, what is self-control? In Greek, in gratia, it's used to refer as to uh, self-control, abstinence, or fasting. That's kind of describing it in a way to not take or not do certain things in a negative way. That's hence, we have a word for that. Ellen White uses the term temperance, right? The ability to say no to certain things. But self-control, she also uses the term that is not just being used as in a negative way. Negative, you understand what I'm saying. I'm saying not take something, but also the ability to take on action. It's essentially the virtue of having mastery over one's desires, one's thoughts, one's feelings, and one's actions. It's having power over these things. It's having control over these 
thinks. Now I know. Well, we tend to think that self-control is a strictly human enterprise, the Bible actually tells us that self-control is a product of our communion. It's a product of being connected to God. This is why it's one of the fruit of the Spirit. And we can say amen to that. Right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And the reality is that none of these fruit is possible to bear without our connection with God. None of them is possible without our willingness to trust in God and to, tr to rely in Him. Self-control is unique in that it's not just something that we strive alone for, nor is it just something we inherit and done with. But it's something that is to be developed and done in collaboration with the Holy Spirit. It's not just by him for us, period, nor is it just by us without him, period. It's both something that we receive and make an effort for as we cooperate, as we collaborate with the Holy Spirit. Self-control is, in essence, having faith in God over our desires, our feelings, our thoughts, our actions, and our circumstances, whatever it is that we experience. That's self-control. But why self-control? Why does this matter? Well, for me, if I didn't have self-control, I would probably be talking to you like this, with no, no teeth. You may laugh, it's true. But physically, think about it. If you have no self-control, it could damage us. It could hurt us physically, and potentially kill us. It could hurt our relationships, right? If we lose control of self, Somebody else always finds it. Think of that. Think about that for a moment. When we lack self-control, we are choosing to be susceptible to being controlled by other things, our impulses, our whims, our feelings, etc. And actually, King Solomon gives us a stark visual for the necessity of self-control when he says in Proverbs 16, verse 32, that it's better to have self-control than to conquer a city. That seems a bit odd. None, none of us is actually going about our way, you know, every day trying to conquer a city, right? Right, exactly. So let me explain a little bit. In the ancient world, people built massive walls around cities and had armed guards around them patrolling them. It's, it's their way of like, this is ours, right? And this is yours. Stay over there. And so if you were, tr you were to attack a city or a country or a nation, you could imagine the amount of effort and the might and the strategy and the intentionality that it takes to conquer a city. Are you with me? And Solomon is arguing that controlling yourself is better than conquering any city. And then he goes on to say in Proverbs 25, verse 28, a person without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Let me translate that for us. The absence of self-control is just outright dangerous. Are you with me so far? Ellen White says it this way, that a person, no, sorry, the highest evidence of nobility in a Christian is self-control. That's from Reflecting Christ. The next quote. Christ is the foundation of new life, physical, mental, social, and spiritual, and through Christ we are enabled to control self. It's only because of Christ who enabled it for us. And that temperance, next slide. Again, like I said, it's a, sim it's a word that she uses often as well, along with self-control. She says, is the foundation of all the graces that come from God and the foundation of all victories to be gained. We need self-control. We need to develop self-control. But here's the thing. The reality of self-control today is that it's such, it has such a bad reputation to the point that no one even wants to talk about it. Yet it's so foundational to all the other virtues like joy, gratitude, and generosity. You know, we hear comments like, Right, um, 
I should, I should really do better. Yeah, I, I really should give that up. Oh, man, yeah, you're right. I, sh I should really go to the gym. Or I should really let go of this anger. I should really stop thinking about this person in this way. I should really let go of this ill thought about this, this, this someone. Or I should really stop thinking negatively about this person. I should really stop shopping on Amazon while I'm in class. And I can save money. Or I should really stop scrolling endlessly. I should really stop eating those cream-filled donuts in the morning. That's just me, okay. Or I, the list goes on and on. I should really be better than this, do better than this. These are real struggles and real places where people can exercise self-control and actually be benefited. But on one hand, there are those who don't even see the necessity. They'll say, they say, they'll say like stuff like this. Self doesn't need to be controlled. It needs to be liberated. For to them, self-expression is the real virtue and not self-control. And self-control is just too boring, too confining. It's like that cop that shows up to your party and shuts it down. <laughs> not that any of us ever have the experience, right? <laughs> Maybe I'll say it. It's like the parent who picks up the children from the party. That works better. But on the other hand, there are those who worry that when you emphasize self-control so much, it will lead to legalism, an approach that reduces faith to just a list of do do's and don'ts. Both of these ideas of self-control are dangerous. And I would submit to you today that the, the idea of biblical self-control isn't about self-reliance, nor is it about earning your way to heaven. And ultimately, it's not about us, but it's about surrendering to God's purposes for us. Amen. It's about trusting God. It's about letting go of control and letting God truly lead in our lives. It's about having faith in the one who began the good work in all of us, and he will bring it also to its completion when he comes. So the questions I want us to, to be thinking about this morning are these. What do we need to surrender to God so that he can have his way in us? What thoughts or what ideas or what emotions, what feelings do we need to let go and render to God and let God lead us? What are we willing to let go, perhaps, so that we can fully trust in him? You know, the Bible is filled with examples of characters exhibiting self-control where they heavily relied and trusted in God to help them. Characters like, I'll just mention a few because we don't have much time. David. David had an opportunity to kill Saul, the very person who was chasing him and trying to kill him. And when Saul accidentally stumbled upon a cave, when he went to the bathroom, right? Remember that story for Samuel 24? In a cave where David just so happened were hiding with his men? What did David do? He showed self-control in not killing Saul because he knew that God still wanted Saul to be king. He'd rather not decide that for himself. Are you with me? Instead of trusting in his own impulses, David let go of his circumstances, his situation, and he trusted God instead. Can you imagine if the, the, the problems in this world, in our churches, in our schools, mercy, in our playgrounds, if they were dealt like this? Just imagine if we were all like David that much self-control, to surrender and to trust God. Matthew 4, you know this story. Jesus gave us the ultimate example of self-control. And despite of Satan's best attempts to attack him, to fall into temptation, after fasting for 40 days, I don't know if you've been hungry before or hangry. I would. But Jesus didn't give an an inch to any of his attacks, to any of his temptation. He is, in fact, the perfect expression 
of all the fruits of the Spirit that we've been talking about, including self-control. And I would like to add, I think it's because he was fully surrendered. He was fully surrendered to his Father's will. And he trusted in him every step of the way. And may we look to, may we look to Jesus as our example as well and desire to be more like him. Like I said, the Bible is filled with a truckload of exhortations to exercise self-control, to resist evil, to flee from lust, to avoid temptation, to abstain from sin, to control your tongue, to guard your heart, and the most graphic of all, to kill the flesh, to die to self. Yet these drastic measures aren't meant to confine us, friends. They are commands from a loving God to designed to give us and to bring us freedom. It enables us to do what is right and what is best for us. It's not restrictive. It's the path to freedom in Christ. And when we don't choose to trust God and rely on his spirit, we're either choosing to be self-reliant or worse, to be controlled by something or someone else. But when we surrender to God, when we trust in the Spirit and look to Jesus as our example and abide in him, that's when true adventure toward freedom in Jesus begins. And self-control just becomes this natural byproduct of our communion with him and a powerful tool for living a life that glorifies God and blesses others. And so when we understand self-control this way, self-control is simply a means to an end. And its ultimate aim has always been to love God and to love others, to serve God and to serve others. Yes, self-control is pivotal for the individual to have and to develop, but it's also essential in the context of relationships, as I said before, in community. It's a powerful tool that helps us to relate to conduct ourselves with each other. It helps us in how we can trust and treat one another and how we care and love for one another. We can exercise self-control so we can give more, we can love more. This is why Paul concludes in Galatians 5 with these words. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in the step with the Spirit. Let's not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. There is a communal aspect of it. There is an outward expression of this self-control. And that is individual purpose of self-control is never to be divorced from its communal aspect. It always leads us to love God and to love others. That's why. So how can we have this self-control, you might ask? Well, I think our scripture reading clues us in how we can truly surrender to God and to his purposes for us and to trust in him. It's precisely by heeding and accepting Jesus' invitation for us daily and to come to him and rest with him, to take on his yoke and to learn from him for he is gentle and lowly in heart. His yoke is easier and his burden is is light. Jesus inviting, he's inviting all of us to come to him with everything. Yes, with all of our feelings. Yes, with all of our thoughts. Yes, with all of our actions. With everything that we've done. With all of our mistakes. With all of our victories. With all of our desires. He wants all of us. And he wants all of us. Everything of us with all that we have and all that we are. Jesus is inviting us to surrender all to him. And there's rest for our souls. He invites us to take on his yoke and learn from him. But in order for us to take on his yoke, we have to let go of our yoke, right? We must be willing to let go of that yoke that we've been carrying and put on his yoke and go in the direction that he is wanting to lead us, and we can learn from him. We must be willing to let go of control and to let God lead in everything. 
The Bible tells us there are two modes, essentially, of life. Two modes of life available to us. Enslavement to sin and life in the spirit. Enslavement to sin and life in the spirit. The first of these speaks of confinement in the most extreme way. But the latter is about our freedom in Jesus. Where a loving guide, no, excuse me, where a loving God guides us and empowers us to live a life that leads to flourishing, to joy, generosity, and the fullness of of love, a life that is covered by his righteousness and not ours, but without self-control, we will always be pulled to the first mode of enslavement to sin. So my hope and prayer for all of us, including myself today, is that we would choose Jesus each day, and that before anything else, we would come to him with everything, with everything. And just rest a while in his presence. And that we would enjoy and soak in being at his feet. Taking on his yoke and being and learning from him. I want to close with one more example. And that is Daniel. Most scholars think that Daniel was a teenager when he was taken from Jerusalem in 605 B.C. with his, with his uh, friends, of course, as captives. And I don't know if you knew this, but the Babylonians were known for their ruthless practices of intimidation. And one of which is like taking the captives of the conquered nation's best young men, right? Their best of the best, their cream of the crop. And then they would brainwash them and then indoctrinate them in every way possible in the ways of Babylon. And so Daniel, imagine with me, and his friends were taken into captivity with potentially all his friends and families gone, murdered. You know what happens, right, when when your country is being besieged and it says that the only ones that are being held captives, the rest is gone. And they walked across Babylonian desert for scholars approximate 800 miles in a day of age people never walk past beyond 30 miles you are in a strange land and then that they would be enrolled in some sort of school of Babylonians they were given Babylonian names they were fed Babylonian food they were assimilated to this culture and way of life that is so foreign to them and perhaps the Babylonians had hoped that they eventually would become this puppet rulers for this respective nations that they had conquered, for the interests of the Babylonian empire. But then Daniel says this. Daniel 1 verse 8 said, he resolved in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's food and with the wine that he drank. He exercised self-control in restraining himself from partaking of any of this culture. Let me be really clear. This is not a health message that what you should and should not drink or eat, this is not that message. What I want for us to remember is that Daniel chose to resolve in his heart that he would not be defiled by anything. He was a captive. He resolved in his heart that his identity and his purpose were never going to be defined by his external circumstances. He chose to believe and to remain true to who he is, or to what God had said who he was. And so today, as my friends come up again and sing this last song together, would you take this song as the moment to ask God personally? To ask God for help, perhaps to identify the very situation or the circumstances that we're in and struggles and or perhaps these feelings, this thought that you've been having. Because I can tell you, like, what we do best in our church at times, we just preach faith over feelings. And we never have time to talk about our feelings and what we're actually experiencing. I think it's much better that we actually spend some time asking God to identify, to acknowledge what we are going through. And then, only then can we actually surrender whatever this is and ask God for courage 
to let go of it. I'm Pastor Tara Van Cross, and we're so glad that you've tuned into our Azure Hills Church YouTube channel. Please like and subscribe and click on the bell so that you'll be notified every time we share new videos. We are so glad that you're here. Until next time, please know that we're praying for you as you continue to be a voice of hope.